Hi, my name is Rich Schmidt. I'm here with James Ron. We're at Abbey Road Farms in Carlton. It's January 21st, 2020. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today, James. We Happy to be here. This. Thanks for coming to my place. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, we'll start with the most important question, which is why wine? How did I get into wine? Uh, I was working my way through school at the University of Washington, and um, I think I strung together three doubles in a row and then went to school the other four days is how I got through it. Uh, so that meant restaurants. You know, that was the, the way to go for me. And worked in some okay places. And after I graduated, I got my, uh, I got a job at Campania in Seattle, which is a great storied restaurant. And the sommelier there, Sean Mead, she ended up being quite the tutor for me, the mm -hmm. mentor. Um, and that's when I first really got into wine. I had sort of thought that I knew some things before in the other restaurants. Uh, usually just because the sale, that's what the info that the sales rep gave me, you know, so regurgitated the same sort of propaganda over and over. <laughs> um, but the wine list of Campania was a thing of beauty and all French, uh, French and Northwest, I should say. Uh, so that got me interested in Oregon Pinot Noir, um, got me interested in all French wine for the longest time. Wine for me, if it wasn't French, it really wasn't wine. I was just, that's, that was my path and that's what I studied. And when I moved back home to Chicago, I got a, re a job at another restaurant, a French restaurant in Chicago called Café Matou. And I became uh, the GM there and the wine director. And I think that's when I really started to learn, you know, how to put a wine list together, um, starting to put theories of how to make wine, you know, what does whole cluster do to wine, you know, um, what does this region, what does this soil type. And I had, you know, zero practical application. I mean, I had, I had, I had not set foot in a winery until a couple few years after I got my sommelier certification. I was just sort of never had an opportunity in Chicago. And uh, so after six years of Catherine Matou and drinking and thinking about nothing but French wine for the most part, um, I got plucked by Stephanie Eisard, who won Top Chef, mm -hmm. to open up her place, Girl and the Goat. And she lived very close to the Catherine Matou, so she would come in and we just would always talk. Uh, so then I had to come up with a global wine list, um, sort of a crash course. Uh, it was humbling. I, you know, had to sort of eat crow and that there were good wines outside of France. <laughs> um, but it was great. It was great in my education. Um, and by that time I had started to call um, a lot of winemakers from Oregon and sort of reestablish those connections that I had. And in a couple few years became a really strong advocate for Oregon wines in Chicago because there weren't many. I mean, I think Irie was buried in like some Southern Wine and Spirits book and they got no traction. Mm -hmm. um, and so I helped people get new distribution. Um, I remember the day I took the, I took the call at the restaurant. Is somebody named Jason Lett on the phone for you? <laughs> Holy shit, yeah, I'll take that call. I've known Jason for a long time, but he's, he's first family of Oregon wines for sure. And uh, so I just, if there was anybody in Oregon, who was, anybody in Chicago who was selling Oregon wines, they came to see me. Mm -hmm. And it was a blast. And so after Girl and the Goat, where I lasted about a year, God, the places, I don't know if you've ever gone, but it is, it is a Saturday night every single day of the week. It is a line at the door at 4.30, and you are kicking people out at 11.30. It's just constant. Um, so after a year of <laughs> living in that environment, I went to a place called Benny's Chop House. And Benny's Chop House is, well, there's no shortage of chop houses in Chicago, um, but this is 100% prime, you know, pretty high end. And they had a wine list of about, I don't know, 400 labels, I think. And they tasked me with putting together the best list in Chicago, which is no small task. So a year later, I was at 1,800 wines on that list. Um, there were single weeks that I would buy 50 wines and put them on the list. Um, and that was my crash course in um, Napa. So I think a lot of people have made careers on shitting on the, Na on the California wine industry. I myself was very included. 
Um, but now all of a sudden I am buying, you know, 100 point Napa wines. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that that piece of humility for me was understa understanding that manipulated, manipulated wines can be done so in a beautiful way. You might not agree with that sort of ethos of winemaking, but there are some gorgeous wines down there. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think you can convince me that there's gorgeous Pinot Noir down there, but that's a whole other story. Um, so yeah, I had all these different forces when I was a sommelier. Um, teaching me all different sorts of things about wine. And each time, sort of, my ring of knowledge would be expanded. Um, and then I was at a tasting one day, and I had, I had grown tired of service, of hospitality, for sure. And I was at a tasting, and Robert Britton, Robert and Alan were there. And uh, they were both behind the table, and so I was just chatting them up and talking to them, and he said, well, come here, let's, let's go have a talk. I don't know if anybody knows Robert. Probably everybody. Uh, he's a little bit gruff. And so I just wanted some advice. So how do I get out of this? How do I get into winemaking? And uh, well, I'll backtrack a little bit. I remember I was on a wine trip when I worked at Girl and the Goat and it, to Walla Walla. Mm -hmm. And I had two job offers if I could get out there that they'd employ me in the cellar. My wife was born and raised in Seattle. So I'm like, babe, babe. I got a couple job offers and, we'll, and uh, we can go back to Washington. And so, you know, nobody here knows my wife, but she's pretty tough broad. <laughs> and she says, where in Washington? <laughs> Walla Walla. She goes, fuck you, James Ron. I am not moving to Walla Walla. I don't even care. I said, why aren't we moving to Portland, Oregon? Because those are the wines you want to make. Huh, why aren't we moving to Portland, Oregon? So, a couple of months later, I'm having this chat with Robert Britton. You know, how do I break out? How do I get in there? And Ellen tells it like he like we were gone for three hours, and I think that's an embellishment. But, uh, <laughs> we were gone for a while, and she was behind the table on her own. But the whole summary of his pep talk to me was essentially, James, fuck UC Davis. Fuck going to Chemeketa. Fuck going to school. That shit's bullshit. Get your ass out there. Get a crappy ass seller job. Go into a bunch of credit card debt. Boom, you're a winemaker. <laughs> and so that's basically, that has been my path to winemaking. I, but I think six months later, I was working at Ponzi as an intern, 2012. So tell me about that. Tell me about your first I can say practical experience. Something about being in the cellar and Ponzi. Uh, it was great. Louisa has been an amazing mentor and supporter of me. Uh, JP is awesome. He's actually the guy who hired me, mm -hmm. and I showed. He hired me earlier than he was supposed to, and so I think <laughs> I had to avoid being seen by Louisa for the first two weeks. So he had me over at the estate doing odd jobs. Because I'm like, dude, I just moved here. I need, I, need to start, I need to work, man. So he got me on the payroll. So I think Louisa was always a little, well, she's a gruff person anyway. But I think she was always a little bit gruffier at me to start. And plus, she, 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 she hates sommeliers. <laughs> like every year, they will hire one to be an intern. So she, like, they'll hire one. So I was, I was that one. And uh, she said it in an interview when I won the uh, wine program of the year at the Heathman. I think she wrote a really beautiful letter on my behalf and said something to the effect of, I hate hiring psalms. All I want to do is ask questions. James <laughs> actually showed up to work. And she had, she rode me. She did. She, I think I, she rode me and rode me and I broke her one day and how did I do that? She had me like down filtering Lee's for like three or four days in a row. And it's not a, it's not a fun thing. And she made some, some quip and she, she's going up the stairs and I screamed at her, you won't break me! <laughs> and she just started laughing and I think her and I were good after that. And so after that I was usually on the ferment floor, which to me is the most exciting place to be. Um, she let me ask all those dumb questions. She let me, you know, run, run temps and ferments and all that. Um, not by myself, but I was there. And that, I was hooked after, after that time. 
And so that job lasted until just before Thanksgiving. I think I was the last man standing as well. Mm -hmm. I thought I had lined something up at uh, Owen Rowe, but that fell through. Um, so I did, I had people like Jason Tosh teach me, teach me some viticulture stuff. So help, helped him plant a couple times. Mm -hmm. uh, discovered that I'm not tough enough to work in the vineyard all every day. Those guys are machines. And then the biggest hiccup, a wonderful hiccup, um, my wife became pregnant. Mm -hmm. And so no, a $13, $13 an hour seller job was out of the question at that point. So I got back into service, mm -hmm. took over the wine program over at the Heathman. And then in 13, I called Janie Brooks. I'm like, you know, Janie, can I just buy like 500 pounds of fruit? I just, you know, all last year Ponzi, I would do this thing for four days straight or I'd do this one thing, but I never was able to see the fruit mm -hmm. from beginning to end. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just wanted my little ferment. I didn't know where I was going to put it, anything, but I just wanted to see it through and I'm in Riesling I've always had a love for Riesling and I figure if I really mess it up then I can just drink it and give it away which whatever and she says oh shit James we dropped 500 pounds of fruit on the floor in a day <laughs> how about a couple tons okay let's, I'll take a couple tons and so I went to pick it up and it was 2.4 tons and I had made an arrangement with uh, Tom and Kate over at Southeast Wine Collective to put in some seller hours and partial trade. Um, and I remember <coughs> so I hand sorted all of that fruit directly into the press by myself between around all after midnight. And it was just me in that place alone. It was awesome. And then I called Chris Williams in the morning and said, okay, dude, what the hell am I do now? Well, you had to sulfur it. Okay, add a sulfur. Call him an hour later. Oh, it smells like it's sulfur now. You totally messed up my wine. He's like, chill out, man. It'll be fine. It'll just be fine. And I learned a lot about what not to do that year. The wine was good. Super zippy. Um, and then because of my connections with Psalms all over the country, I had a friend from California. Um, Eric Quirrell's back, and Jared Heber, they opened up a new distributor called GPS. And they're like, no, just send it, we'll buy it. Oh, you wanna taste it or anything? No, just send like 30 cases. Great, and there it went. So, and this was the first label, so this one. So I don't know if you've ever tried to design a wine label. Um, it, it was maddening, I mean, so, you know, what do you do? You come up with like your family crest, you put a, well, I have, to, I have to put this in there. I fucking hate wine labels with animals on them. Irony is right there, but these are better. Uh, so, I mean, but what do you do, right? And so, I just put my name on it, James Ron, and I figured that was easy enough. Um, and then, that's my Jeep. And my wife and I have owned that Jeep for almost 20 years, and we've been out of state, uh, to the side of the road at a gas station or whatever and people will pull off because they know it's us. So it's just, that has become synonymous. Um, he doesn't get driven every day, he's pretty old, but he'll probably end up being out at just a, as the sign, mm -hmm. sitting up by the road. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so there, there it went. So as you're, as that's, you, you've got a place to sell your wine, you've got, you've got your label finally designed, did you have intent to continue at that point? Did you have this idea that you would have a wine label from then on out, or was there, were, there, were there doubts at that point? Was there, any, was there any hesitation? No, the only thing that was holding me back is I couldn't quit my job. You know, I had a little one in the house, and my, I was very fortunate enough for that job to pay me enough to have my wife stay at home for the first few, until Margaret went to uh, preschool. Mm -hmm. uh, so time and money was limited, for sure. I mean, still, I don't, outside of some dinners and you know, flights to sell wine, I've never taken money out of the winery. You know, it's always just stayed back into it. 
Um, but little by little, so I think that was 13, and 14 I made, uh, did I make two Rieslings in 14? I did. Um, and Gamay, which Gamay was actually fairly easy to find back then. Uh, 15, I made two Rieslings and two Gamays, and then I introduced Pinot Meunier. Uh, and so I've just steadily grown every single year. Now having this place built allowed me to double production last year. Um, so I think I'm going to have 10 SKUs, and then I'll probably go up to, probably grow by the same amount this year. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know how skew wise, but case production will probably be about, um, I imagine about 1800 cases in 2020. And that's up from my first vintage, I think I made 150 or something, <laughs> 150 <laughs> cases. Uh, sold out. So uh, yeah, it was kind of full steam ahead and it wasn't until 2018 that it was indeed my only job. So once the Heathman closed, I did work harvest over at Raptor Ridge. So, I was only making wine, that, that vintage, which was a blast. Although I had, I was making wine at Ponzi, at the Southeast Wine Collective and Raptor Ridge. <laughs> and I was exhausted, but it was the most beautiful, fulfilling type of exhaustion. Mm -hmm. I love getting the hell beat out of me during harvest. There's something really great about it. Uh, and then I had to go back into, I opened up uh, Jackrabbit and then I went and ran departure for a year. And so 18, though, was finally, it was really, really my only job. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it was, I made wine over at Kraft in Carlton. Mm -hmm. And that was amazing. So tell me, tell me why, uh, you mentioned a love of Riesling, so mm -hmm. Riesling's first thing did. Why Gamay, why Pinot Meunier, why the kind of off the beaten path uh, wines to start your, with your label? Um, I came here to make Pinot Noir, okay, that's, why I showed up. Um, but mediocre Pinot Noir sucks. It is, it is, there's no wiggle room with Pinot Noir in my opinion. And I didn't wanna fuck it up. So I didn't make it. Um, but I've always liked lighter red wines. It's just big chewy stuff. Um, not into, you know, even after my year at, at Benny's Shop House of drinking massive wines, it took me probably three months to get my palate back to appreciation of a delicate wine. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was a thing. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just always what I've been into. So I, you know, I make Pinot Meunier, I make Trousseau, uh, I made, I mean, some of the gamets can be a little bit sizable, but I made Mondeuse the last two years. Uh, I made Syrah this year. North Valley Syrah, though, it's going it's to be nice and delicate. Mm -hmm. um, so in 15, well, plus when I got here, and everybody's making Pinot Noir, of course, um, I didn't want to try to hit my head against the wall and try to sell Pinot Noir in the land of Pinot Noir. Mm -hmm. And so I felt that my labels and my off varieties would sort of get me noticed, and I get to have more fun. Um, I think at the beginning, I felt that I would, there was less wines that my wines would be compared to. Mm -hmm. um, now that I'm getting, now that I'm, I'm getting much, become much better winemaker, now that I, I think they stand on their own. You know, it's not just because it's Trousseau. Now it's really damn delicious Trousseau. Uh, I did make Pinot Noir in 15, it was like a last minute, you know, right before harvest, mm -hmm. all the deals come out, mm -hmm. and I made it, and it was all 828 clown uh, from the Coast Range, and I just didn't like it. It was the most alcoholic wine I've ever made. I mean, I, I probably should have picked like four or five days earlier. Um, it's the only wine I've ever watered back. Uh, I just wasn't, wasn't happy with it mm -hmm. at all. It sold out. You know, um, I made so now that I've been making Pinot Noir for the last two years for the farm here, uh, I th I'm going to make Pinot Noir for my own label in 2020. Mm -hmm. I'm going to spend way too much on some outrageous fruit um, and just go for it. Mm -hmm. but yeah, I feel like I'm ready after 
eight vintages. I think I'm finally ready to make some Pinot Noir. Nine vintages. Math is hard. <laughs> so yeah, that's that's why I, I came here to make Pinot Noir. But it just and now that I'm distrib distributed in multiple places, you know, adding Pinot Noir to my list of SKUs is a little bit different than saying I got Pinot and Pinot Gris. That's all I make. Will you please buy it for me? And I'm, like I said, I don't want to be in that game. <laughs> Tell me about the early reactions to your wine. You mentioned you, you had so, some friends who made, made the sales a bit easier than they might have been. Mm -hmm. What were people's reactions to your wines when you started? Uh, the reactions of my Rieslings are still the same. There's a shit ton of sugar in them. Um, my intellectual self can appreciate and get into dry Rieslings, but my heart will never love one. It will just not. Um, but my, my wines are profoundly acidic, so and they can handle 30 to 40 grams of sugar, and it doesn't come across as cloying. You know, still have a nice texture, which I've always been sort of fascinated about the texture that oak fermented Riesling with some sugar left in has. Mm -hmm. You know, it just sort of lays there on your palate for, for a day, and I just... So, but the consumer reaction is always the same. Is it sweet? I, I've stopped trying to convince them. Yes, <laughs> next. <laughs> You're not going to like it, lady. You know. Uh, whereas before, I would just try to fight that fight. Just try to fight. No, not anymore. But Psalms, Psalms love it. It's got all that acid. It's got some nice sugar. It's got a fatness to it. So the reaction has always been good. I think a lot of... I mean, you know if they're really, if they're really loving it because they'll, they'll fucking buy it. Okay. So I think in with winemaking, just like anything in life that you put out there that's a part of you, mm -hmm. you have to grow kind of a thick skin. Um, and I, I had 15 years of service, so I mean, I was accustomed to, if I selected a wine for one of my guests, maybe it wasn't perfect. Um, when it was my wine, it became a little bit more personal. Mm -hmm. Um, but they're fine. We don't. I, I just, I just sort of blow them off and tell them we don't all like the same shit. You know, that's pretty okay. <laughs> <coughs> Excuse me. So tell me about about Abbey Road and and how you how you ended up here and and, and what's going on here because obviously it's it's going to undergone a lot of change in the last few years. So yeah. Tell me about the about the farm and what's and what the project is like here. Um, so after the Heathman closed, um, and I was just collecting unemployment and working under the table for helping people bottle and top barrels, you know, whatever. And I finally figured I should probably look for another job. <laughs> and I saw this ad on Craigslist, I'm sure. A new place opening up, they needed a, a wine director. Okay, you know, I might go back to a neighborhood spot. Let's see what it's all about. And I went there, and they they couldn't afford me, and they really wouldn't know what to have done with me anyway. But it was my opinion that they needed a huge amount of help to open up a restaurant, and I had opened up numerous. Um, and that little restaurant is Quain Trail, up on North Mississippi. Um, Design their wine program, their steps of service, you know, helped get their place and stuff. I installed the GM and it was two months of consulting. Mm -hmm. I'm like, you, they needed my help. And so they, they, I, they pitched them that and they were like, yeah, okay. And so I check in every few months to see how things are going or whatnot. And uh, I get a call from them one day, like, we just bought a farm. <laughs> Good. <laughs> okay, what are you going to do with a damn farm? Uh, and they said, well, we want to plant vines. And we don't want to plant the regular stuff. So can you help us? Yeah, I, of course I can help you. So um, got together with Sterling Fox, who's the viticulturist who oversees this right now, um, and got together and see what kind of plant materials out there. Uh, read way too many uh, clonal selection reports from UC Davis, which is some of the most boring reading you'll ever do. And started to get this plan going, making this a, a working vineyard. And then 
And then I got, there's one night I got these text messages. Like, how much wine do you make? I told him. How much wine would you want to make? I told him. And a the, the couple more questions. I just called him, like, what's going on over there? Let's have a meeting. Okay. And uh, they said, well, we're thinking about building a winery. And we want to be a co op. And maybe you could make your wine there. You know, it's far. I live in southeast Portland, it's an hour away. Mm -hmm. um, okay, but you know, but you can't build a co op and hand, hand like five winemakers a key and just say, you know, best of luck, you need somebody to run it. Well, yeah, would that be you? Yes. Yes, <laughs> you bet your asset will be me. Good, because you're meeting with the architect next week. And that's <laughs> how it all started. So, um, all because I answered an ad for a little neighborhood restaurant that I had no business in working at. <laughs> um, so, we, I think, when did we, this was a 12,000 square foot horse arena. Now, the footprint is identical, except for the crush pad. And it was deconstructed board by board. So all the, all the old lumber was reclaimed. This is actually the old siding. Uh, the whole farm was lined in this stuff, same color. Um, and so when did that happen? Almost two years ago? In May, I think it will have been two years when they started to take this thing apart. Uh, construction took a year. Uh, it shouldn't have taken a year, but we had a couple neighbors that fought us all the whole way uh, with everything. Um, but here we are, we have a co-op. So I have my brand here. Um, I make the Abroad Farm Wines, uh, the Wilkins Wines, which is a reserve line that will come out soon. Um, my associate winemaker, whom you know, Luke Wild, uh, he has his brand here. Uh, it's the Terra Sellers. He has his side hustle brand here, Lares. Uh, Chris Lubberstead makes his wines here. He's our, he's our client. And we'll probably add two more clients this year. We took it easy. Um, brought in 70 tons total. Um, this, we could probably push twice that. Wow. In a very uncomfortable way, but I'm sure it could be done. And we have, like I said, we have 39 acres planted right now. 13 different varieties. Um, we have, I think, six more acres to go in. Just waiting on plant material, waiting on getting pulsar in this country. Can't find pulsar anywhere, and they don't. Those in the Jura don't really want to let go of their pulsar. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have. Um, I do a Pinot Noir on the ground, but no Dijon or anything. It's all Heritage Clone Pinot Noir, Heritage Clone uh, Chardonnay. Uh, there's no Pinot Gris on this damn site. I did plant Riesling, um, just because. They've been grafting over and ripping out Riesling for way too long. Um, first Riesling I ever made was on a vineyard, and then Bill Holleran bought it and took it all out. It's all Pinot Noir now. Uh, Trousseau Noir, Trousseau Gris, Mondeuse, Pulsar, if we can get it. I do have Mentia, Gadeo, Cab Franc, which I'm really excited to have North Valley Cab Franc, Chenin Blanc, Gruner, Aligote, Five Acres Gamay. Four acres Meunier. Is that, that's not, maybe that's four. I don't know how that, I think it's 13. Um, and so, yeah, we sort of want to be an incubator, mm -hmm. you know, for brands like mine and for brands like, like Luke's. People don't want to do the normal stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I have, there are a couple of plots out there that are already sort of spoken for, handshake wise. Because I don't ever foresee Abbey Road Farm getting too off the beaten path with varieties. I think we'll probably stay pretty mainstream here. Um, and so yeah, I have first right of refusal for all the fruit out there. So I, not that, I don't know. I have, the Meunier I get is plant, self-rooted, planted in 1982. Um, I'm not giving up that contract mm -hmm. because I've got four acres of it out here of super baby vines. <laughs> um, I'll probably come up with, I don't know, um, my branding might change a little bit to accommodate some mm -hmm. declassified wines, so to speak. I, everything I make is, is site-specific and variety-specific. I don't blend um, outside of maybe some topping at the end of the year that I just need some juice. But um, I may do keep elevate these more and then do like a declassified where I can 
do some blends or do some super young vines or something like that. But I think we're going to sell a lot of it. And this site will produce about 150 tons a year, um, which is a decent amount. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it'll never all be consumed here. We like, we like having fun. We like doing what we want to do. And um, I find that a lot of our friends are the same way. So we're going to be doling out some good fruit. And Sterling's an awesome farmer, so they've done a really good job in the development of this site. Are there any varietals that you're concerned about growing here that you ha haven't seen evidence of growing here? Or are they all pretty much, you're pretty confident they're going to come out how you want them to come out? Well, I don't know what, I don't know really how to answer that. You know, is the Trousseau and the Mondeuse and the Pulsar going to be just like the Jura? No. You know, uh, but it, I get frustrated when Oregon Pinot Noir is compared so closely with Burgundy. There are similarities, you know, in climate-wise. Uh, they've got it worse than we do as far as keeping their vines happy. Um, you know, and people have told me that that Cab Franc will never get ripe. Well, what the hell is ripe? I mean, my, the Syrah that I pulled off a die on this year soaked up to 19.5 bricks. <laughs> in the winery. Um, first wine I ever chapelized. <laughs> uh, it's going to do what it's going to do here. Mm -hmm. And we're going to find a way to work with it. Because uh, I kind of like those light Loire, a little bit green Cab Franc. So I'm not here to make Walla Walla wine. I don't need 25 bricks. And so if, if, I, if something comes in that door at 20 or 21, it's going to be great. And it's going to be exactly the kind of delicate red wine that I want to make. So, no, I'm not concerned. I mean, there's there's no Menthea here. That went out on a limb. But they have some on a lemma in the gorge. And that wine is super, super good. Um, granted, we don't have a climate exactly like the gorge, not even really all that close, mm -hmm. to be honest with you. Um, it's going to be great. Yeah, and the Godeo, there's no Godeo here. Uh, that's got to be the first Godeo in Oregon. Um, the Shenan, um, we're going to see if we, we're going to see. Shenan and Cap Franc are both late, late ripening. Uh, and we let it hang and we raisinate it and we find something to do with it, <laughs> you know? I don't want to hold myself up and my style of winemaking up against anybody else. And, and well, I do my peers because I, I, I I have a lot of respect and admiration for a lot of my peers, and so, and they've all taught me a lot. But I'm not going to sit here and hold myself to another region and what they can do here. It's like I used to tell, I used to tell, and I kind of still tell people this, but well, how long should we hold on to this wine? What do what do you want out of it? I mean, hold it until it has no damn fruit left, until there's three inches uh, above the you know below the neck. I mean, just. It's just because. See what that's going to evolve into. What do you consider the perfect time? You know, when the acid and the, and the tannins start to mellow out a little bit? I mean, I don't know. I don't have an answer for you. Um, so it's the same thing with, is, are these vines going to get perfectly ripe? We'll see. Perfect for here. They will. Do you see more places doing what you're doing here in terms of the, that massive amount of diversity and new new varieties that aren't very common in the region. Do you see people following that lead or are you following someone else's lead with that? There are people that are doing graft, for sure, a lot of top graft. So Omero up on Ribbon Ridge where I get some a lot of fruit. Chad Stock just top grafted like an entire block of Pinot Noir mm -hmm. and planted and he, he they planted some Zweigel to Saint Laurent and the Mondeuse and the Trousseaus, both of them, um, and some other stuff that I don't even know what the hell's up there. Um, Johan is planting, but they've always got some off varieties, you know, and it's a big site. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't know if anybody's done it like at the onset. Mm -hmm. I haven't heard of anybody like that. Um, it's more piece by piece. Well, let's see how this one does mm -hmm. now. Um, a lot of people are going, are grafting over to Gamay. They have been for the last four or five years. I think Gamay prices are going to fall soon. Um, 
so yeah, I think people are dabbling with it, but I don't know if anybody has had the conviction that we've had here just to go for it. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna stand out in that way. Mm -hmm. I mean, because people are still planning Pinot Noir. There's too much Pinot Noir here. And those are the same people that don't understand that they can't get anybody to buy their Pinot Noir come October. They're, they're four, they're four year fine Pinot Noir. Mm. There's too much of it here. Um, and whereas I think that Oregon should hang their hat on Pinot Noir, um, in my opinion, that's why I have five acres of it in, um, it's not the only answer. So I think the diversity of this site um, will just, I don't know, what am I trying to say? It'll be very Oregonian, for sure. I mean, I can't believe we don't have pot plants yet, but that's a whole other story. More diversity for the future, yeah. Right. We are, we are going to put it in a produce farm, I think, next year. Uh, about a 15-acre produce farm. Um, we want the site to produce many things. We'll start beekeeping next year as well. Um, what did I bring up the other day? I want a falcon. There'll be a falcon out <laughs> right here, too. Yeah. Nice. And you have, obviously, animals on the farm, and it's a, it's a bed and breakfast as well. So it's a whole, you got a whole thing going here. It's it, a pretty big operation, and you know the money maker is the events. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm an afterthought compared to the event. that thing pays the bills mm -hmm. that makes all these salaries work. Mm -hmm. um, we want to do as much as possible that on this site that the site will allow us to do. So you mentioned, I think, pieces of this in some of your other, earlier answers, but how would you describe your winemaking philosophy and, and how has it maybe evolved since you started sort of dabbling in, in making wine? My first year, I um, didn't want to add, you know, wanted to add the least amount of sulfur possible. And even when um, I had to arrest fermentation, it was like dabbling with the sulfur. I didn't want to add anything to my wines ever. and Lo and behold, the ferments wouldn't stop or even slow down, and it went too dry for me. And so, what I learned the next year, it gets practically a German amount of sulfur. It's like a, over 100 parts per million. What I do, I whack it really hard, um, but it, it binds up to the sugar. And so, I think I okay. Well, manipulation isn't a terrible thing in certain ways. Uh, even still, I waited another couple of inches before I, I mean, before I sulfured right at, at crush, um, which I always do now, just about everything. I, I vary the amounts depending on how pretty or terrible looking the fruit is. Um, and so I guess my, I, my, I strive to be as hands-off as possible. Um, the winery was designed partly to be very flexible because I really I think the most important parts are the moving of liquid and temperature control. And if the fruit is sound, you should be able to let the wine let the wine make itself. Um, but it's never been an ethos of mine. Like I will never draw a line in the sand to not fix a wine um, by adding whatever mm -hmm. to it. Um, my first problem was I think 15. One of my gamets went totally sideways with VA and went cold at like two bricks. Could not start it back up. The VA was just climbing like crazy, um, like four grams per liter, which is over four times the perceptible level. Um, so what I did is um, I bought, well first I had a reverse osmosis filter it, which is not a fun process. Um, and then, so that was January, and it still hadn't finished, but it had to be clean before it would go. And then I bought 10 pounds of organic Chilean table grapes, and I started a culture in my living room above the heater vent, um, and basically doubled down. Five gallons between 10, 10 becomes 20, until I had gone through the entire lot of like 180 gallons. So I finished primary in like end of February. Um, but you know what, the wine was good. I think, I made two gamets that year, and I think people preferred that one, consumer-wise, 
than the other one. I, I disagreed with them, but I wasn't going to tell them not to buy my wine. And I just sort of have learned along the way of if it needs help, if it needs a case of acid, um, I'm going to throw it in there. Because mm -hmm. I would like to be, continue to grow as a winemaker and become more and more and more skilled mm -hmm. and have more and more control on the, on the viticulture side, which I'm about to, uh, to where I can get the picks exactly where I want them. Mm -hmm. But I mean, in a year like this, the fruit was terrible. I mean, it, it was such a, the end of the growing season was just murder. Mm -hmm. Nobody was making picks because it was our time to pick. It was making picks because this is the only dry day for the next 10. Um, I made one pick at Dion because the birds showed up. Birds just showed up today, pick it tomorrow. Great. <laughs> you know? And I had some mushy fruit come in. Um, so no, that all got added. Sulfur, I, I fed it, and granted, what I, food I use is organic, it's just yeast holes. I don't use DAP or anything like that. Because um, I believe in taking your stuff to the lab and getting the numbers and find out nutrients and all that stuff, and you can make adjustments in your winemaking as you go on. So I guess that's my, my philosophy is the anti-philosophy. I try to do the best I can just to let it do its thing, and I pay really close attention. It all comes from being on the ferment floor in Ponzi mm -hmm. and just feeling that ferment be alive and smelling it and tasting it and getting in air, get dirty. Um, almost everything can be, can be trolled right there. Mm -hmm. So now I'll never add color or tannin chips or any like crap like that. So um, there is a line. There, yeah, there is, there is a total line. but. Will I have to kiss some things with acid or maybe water it back a little bit or this might get a little bit more sulfur and mm -hmm. this is going to get fed with some organic yeast holes and yeah, I'll, I'll nudge it like that. Mm -hmm. But color purple 10 or whatever the hell it's called and it will never be in my wines. You mentioned earlier uh, the difference in reaction to your wines from the sommeliers versus consumers mm -hmm. and I'm curious if uh, your sommelier background, d does that, do you feel like that lends itself to making a different kind of wine than if you than if you had gone come into wine making a different way do you feel like you're making wine for a different palate hmm. um that's a that's a great question um maybe unconsciously i don't know if i've ever really thought about that Uh, I will say that I, it's always been important to me to get my wines in front of Psalms and on, on wine lists uh, rather than bottle shops. Um, but the, my labels have been so successful, my actual labels, that they are really good at, at bottle shops. They really stand out, so I am in a ton of bottle shops, especially in California. Um, yeah, I just wanted to make delicious wine. I never wanted to reinvent the wheel. I never wanted to come up with some new blend or new way. Um, I will try new methods, but only because it makes things easier or better. But I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to be a pioneer here. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to make something delicious. Um, so, whereas all my, my psalm buds, um, they, can be, they can dork out and and blind it and everything else that makes Psalm so dumb, being one, I'm going to say that. Um, but I am happy as shit if somebody just, I, I, I love it when I get photos when people tag me on Instagram of my wines at their table. Love it. So as long as they just think it's delicious and everybody else thinks it's delicious, then well, I'm happy. So. What have you seen uh, since you've been in the Oregon wine industry? What have, what have you seen change? What, are the, what is the difference uh, from when you got into Oregon wine to now? And what, what does the Oregon wine industry look like today in, in 2020? I think we are in the middle of a big shift in the wine industry here. Um, like I said, you will still have, uh, will still be dominated by Pinot Noir. Um, I have a feeling it's gonna slow. Um, I think the 
general consumer is not buying nearly as much high-end premium wine. Um, I mean, you know, Serene will always do well by their wine club and their and their 200-point wines and all that crap, but um, I don't think that's where the consumers are going with that. I think that. I have a feeling there's a, a lot of wine drinkers, younger wine drinkers now, they're more into coming across something unique and cool that has integrity um, than saving up for, you know, whoever is making Shea Vineyard right now. Um, and wine's a food. You know, wines shouldn't be a luxury. I'm, I'm, I'm behind it 100%. And I have drank some outrageously amazing and expensive um, like Desert Island wines. I've had all the growths, all the first growths. I've drank probably the majority of the Grand Cruz in Burgundy. Um, all very, you know, all aged. I've had a 1948 Rickberg by DRC. I mean, it's just, that's not where wine should be. Wine's a food. Wine should be an everyday thing. Wine should be approachable and yeah, it should be delicious and leave it to somebody else to pick it apart and experience that. Um, I'm thrilled. I'm, I'm extraordinarily lucky to have drank some of the wines I've drunk. Um, but I never wanted to be that. And I think also, I think as far as the Oregon market goes for consumers, yeah, Oregon we might be losing a little bit, but Oregon has always been really good at supporting, I don't want to say handcrafted, but I'm just going to, you know, stuff that's made here, you know, a small operation. I mean, look at Jacobson Salt. Really? Jacobson Salt, is that? Yeah, he's awesome, dude. But can you hit that, the amount of success from that guy mm -hmm. by harvesting salt. He did it. Um, I think Oregon, Oregonians, I think are very, very good at supporting folks here that are just fighting, fighting, trying to do their own thing. Um, other other markets? I don't know. California is pretty provincial as far as supporting their own, but they're open to some 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 cool geeky stuff too. Um, Chicago should be, but it's really. Not, nah, but Denver was hard to really break through in because they're pretty set in their ways, mm -hmm. and they don't have anybody local that they need to support. Mm -hmm. There are wineries in the Western Slope, but not, not nothing of note as far as I know. Um, so yeah, I think I you couple that with people still planting Pinot Noir, and still are shocked that they're not getting a hundred dollars a bottle for it, um, where the the rest of us are sort of bubbling up and doing our thing. And I think there's a whole, I think, class of winemakers. I mean, classes like a graduating mm -hmm. class mm -hmm. that are just starting to hit their stride. Um, and I think it's going to mix things up quite a bit here. I mean, but you're all, you, you always have Jason Lett over there making the same style wines his father made. Mm -hmm. You still have Robert Britton, who, in my opinion, is the best winemaker in the state, hands down. Um, and they're always going to be successful, but I think the class, the next class, is going to do it a little bit differently. It's already happened in Napa. You have all the old assistant winemakers that are working for graduated at Davis and working in big Napa houses or big Sonoma houses, mm -hmm. and now they're now they got their own gigs and they're doing cool stuff. And I, I'm just starting to see old style cabs being coming out of California, like 1970s style. Mm -hmm. Alcohols of 12 and a half percent, you know, stuff like that, it's already happening. And I think we'll, we're going through so, a similar sort of reorganization of what the wine industry is gonna be here. Mm -hmm. So what does it look like in, say, 2030? What does the wine industry look like? Uh, I hope we'll survive. Um, I, think, I think it'll be v vibrant. Um, I think we'll be known for other things other than Pinot Noir. I think Pinot Noir will uh, be known as that graying old man who refuses it to change. Um, and then I think eventually we'll have a, a revitalization of Pinot Noir. 
everything ebbs and flows. Mm -hmm. And I think they're, they're, we're having a lot of pushback. Um, wine buyers in Portland, good luck on getting some Pinot Noir on their shelves, um, that aren't long established houses. And I think though the pendulum will come back and Pinot Noir will probably become just as gorgeous as she always has been. We'll see. I don't know. I, I, I hope I hope that all the money that's coming from California, um, people are losing fruit contracts because of um, wineries being bought. Um, and I would, what I'm fearful of is that we're going to have more of a prevalence of large operations and less, you know, little quirky tasting rooms. Um, I mean, I, sit, I say that as I sit in a brand new building, you know, but we, nothing about us is large scale. Mm -hmm. And I think most organizations with money, if they have that much money, they're going to go big. And so I hope that we are not losing some of the, the simple sort of hospitality that I think lives in Oregon. What about for yourself as you look forward for both your own company, for Abbey Road as you look down the road? What are you, what are you seeing for the future? What are you hoping? Maybe what are you, what are you fearing? Uh, I fear that uh, I won't make it. I'm driven by fear, I think. Um, I expect I will. I'm not terribly, terribly worried about it. Uh, for me, I will, God, in 10 years, you can even just go in two years if you My want. My little girl will be driving. <laughs> Fuck. She's six and a half right now. Uh, God, that just scared the shit out of me, man. Um, I don't know if I will be here in 10 years on this site. I'll always be involved in it somehow. Um, I've always wanted my own, like an urban winery, I mm -hmm. think. But I don't know, this place would be extraordinarily difficult to leave. I mean, so it's more than a dream come true for me. Um, I'll be here for a while, that's for sure. I have no plans of going anywhere. Um, but I, if, if there was a change, I could see opening up my own small winery. Yeah. I've always been attracted to Oregon City. I would love to have an urban winery there. Um, the farm's going to be humming, so. All those vines are going to be producing a lot of fruit. Um, I don't think this place is going to change. All, we're just going to get a lot busier. We opened up in May, Memorial Day weekend, with no, just just sort of quietly open the doors. And we didn't even have signs put up until two weeks ago, I don't think. Uh, I have, and just from May to November, the numbers and how much we increase from week to week. Um, and now we have PR firm in place and now we have signs and we have, you know, we're in the publications that we want to be in and all that. Mm -hmm. I think it's going to be nutso here, which is awesome. Mm -hmm. um, the sooner I can open up seven days a week um, and have and double the size of my taste room staff, uh, the better. And Luke and I will be over there and we'll be uh, just sort of quietly humming along. I mean, I never, I don't think I ever want to make more than 2,500 cases for myself. Mm -hmm. I would much rather take my time and be like a little one or two person operation. There's no way I ever want to make like 10,000 cases. That just sounds horrible. Um, so I never wanted to be big. I just wanted to kind of do my own thing off to the side somewhere. And so in 10 years, I imagine I'll still be doing that. Maybe I'll start to pay myself. <laughs> That's the dream. <laughs> Something. Something's <laughs> got to gotta give. You know, redo. Uh, his name's Billy, by the way. Anyway, Billy the Jeep? Yeah. You know, redo Billy. Put him on a lift kit and all rad. I don't know. Uh, but yeah, I think the farm will be going really, really strong. The base that we've put down, um, I think, is extraordinarily strong. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, like I said, Luke and I will probably still be here and doing our thing and 
we'll probably be expanding the number of wines we'll be making for the farm. We will eventually get into having, say, four, five, six different sparkling wines that we make here. Mm. All varying different styles. Um, and I, I think if we just, Luke and I just continue to push ourselves and do things because we think it's neat and because we don't know how to do it right now, and we go figure out how to do it, as long as we will always have that sort of drive, mm -hmm. I think we'll be pretty damn happy doing it. So you mentioned sparkling, and, and obviously you have uh, a, an abundance of varieties here to try. Is there anything else you're hoping to try, a style you want to try, a different gr grape you want to try, something else you're looking forward to experimenting with? Well, I've never worked with Minthia or Gadeo, mm -hmm. so finding out what makes them happy is going to be, mm -hmm. you know, I'm going to have those type of projects. Uh, I do want to learn how to make Method Champenoise. Because um, my, my little girl, what kind of wine do you want Papa to make? Hmm, the bubbly kind, of course, the bubbly kind. So, I think she was two. Um, no, I don't, I don't know if I have a plan. I just, I, whatever is just gonna come up. I am, there's a little plot right here, not go still, but on this side of the little pathway up there. It's about 1.2 acre. And what we're gonna do is, um, it's gonna be a hand farmed plot. And we're gonna have varieties from each block mm -hmm. represented over here. So you can walk through and see the different, the different mm -hmm. varieties. And I'm really excited to hand farm that whole thing because we're gonna go narrow so you can't get tractors through there or anything like that. Mm -hmm. And being able to spend time and more on the viticulture side. I have 12 vines of Gamay in my home in Southeast Portland. <laughs> Powdery mildew killed it. Killed <laughs> it this year. Just lost it all. Uh, but I want more hands-on, mm -hmm. and so we're really excited about developing that. And we'll probably start start developing that this spring. Um, but we're going to take cuttings from that site, so planting will be a little bit slow, I think. Mm -hmm. but yeah, that's yeah, going to be fun. This question I neglected to ask earlier that I kind of want to back up to and ask now. Uh, obviously, you, you, you had a large knowledge of wine uh, as a, from the consumer side, from the sales side. Is there anything about the making of it or the, the process of it that, that surprised you or that caught you off guard as you, as you got into the cellar for the first time? Did you have like a moment where you're like, I had no idea this, this was part of the process? Or did you have a pretty good understanding when you started making wine? I, I think um, certainly temperature control was new. I don't think I ever really th even thought about it, mm -hmm. you know, because when you're studying wine, you know, how long was the maceration? How long, how long did this take for primary? You know, you have those, but I don't think I ever sort of connected temperature with that. And so Louisa kept, I think, keeps her temperatures a little bit warm, about 80 degrees is her target. Mine's 75, um, I just want a low and slow. Mm -hmm. um, I don't inoculate with yeast, so it freaks some people out that I'm using a slightly cooler ferment. Um, but I've never, I've only had that one wine get stuck, so. Um, so I th suppose that for sure, um, which I think I said I've incor incorporated in such a large amount, large degree as my winemaking now. Um, Bottling sucks. I learned that for a second. <laughs> really, really sucks. Um, Why is that? It's just monotonous. You're dumping glass for eight hours a day. Like Ponzi, when they when they start bottling their Pinot Gris, it's three weeks of bottling Pinot Gris. <laughs> eight hours. That it's not a good way to make a living. Um, I don't think any real large process sort of surprised me all that much. But one of the things I love about way making the most is I, w if I still learn one or two tricks every single vintage mm -hmm. that makes one little thing easier or better. Uh, so if I can pull, if I can get a takeaway, it's been, it's been a blast working um, with Luke 
this vintage because we just we can bounce ideas off mm -hmm. and we can say yeah let's do that or I, that's so dumb I can't believe he thought of that or you know <laughs> whatever um, so no I don't think there was any large thing except other than temperature and maybe the, just the scale of watching I mean at Ponzi we had 100 ton days and now I'm going to shoehorn 100 tons for all the harvest into this place mm -hmm. so I think the scale maybe have been a surprise um, and then when I was when I went to the Southeast Wine Collective to make my own wine the next year seeing a small scale was a surprise mm -hmm. you know because I came from Ponzi and they have seven forklifts you know during harvest anyway and now I was at the Southeast Wine Collective and that place is like a is like a is a packed forgotten closet they do so much tonnage which has little space mm -hmm. so I think that was probably my takeaway from being over there here we're somewhere in the middle I think but yeah you mentioned that, that Robert Britton was the one who kind of gave you the advice as you were making the, the leap mm -hmm. if someone were to come to you <clears throat> and ask about getting into the Oregon wine industry what would you tell them what would your advice be <clears throat> Um, I have given advice because, um, you know, the, the dream is always I'm going to be an intern for one harvest and then I'm going to get hired somewhere. And it's a rare dream to, to come true. Mm -hmm. uh, I have had, I have a good buddy from Chicago who worked here for three harvests now. Um, you still can't seem to find a permanent gig. Uh, so it's I tell people, because they look at my successes that I've had in Oregon, and maybe they just think if I can do it, anybody can do it. That's probably what they think. Um, and I try to explain to them that my success is extraordinarily unlikely. You know, from basically the 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 relationships within the wine industry that I've been making since the late 90s mm -hmm. um, has allowed a lot of this other stuff to fall into place for me. Um, I saw some winemakers that I considered more, much more skilled than I am, but they could never sell a thing. Whereas I had that luxury of a network of psalms all over the country. Um, so I tell them it's unlikely, but I also encourage them to get into the cellar and just put their nose down and work as hard as they possibly can. And, you know, something will fall into place mm -hmm. eventually. Mm -hmm. I think what I, what life taught me um, with the coming of my daughter Margaret is that I was uh, I was feeling discouraged that having a new having a baby would impede my progress. You know, I came here to do one thing. Mm -hmm. God damn it, that's all I was going to do. And I think it accelerated it in ways that I don't I couldn't have foreseen. Mm -hmm. um, So plans don't always work, unless it's somebody else's plan for you, then that sometimes works. Uh, yeah, I, I try not to be too optimistic when I'm giving advice. Um, but I am a big believer in um, building a life of experiences. and coming to work a few harvests and then having to go back to that restaurant job is a lot of experiences there and so yeah yeah I'm not as gruff as Robert <laughs> <laughs> Robert has told me to suck it up and go out and do it and uh, I don't know maybe I should give that advice who knows it worked on you it worked it worked for me <laughs> very very fortunate mm -hmm. 
that's all the questions that I have for you. Is there anything I didn't ask that I should have? Anything we didn't cover that we should have covered? I don't think so. Um, I guess I mentioned that Oregon has been very kind to myself and my family. Mm -hmm. And I've been to other wine regions where they're just, they don't help each other out. Mm -hmm. Um, the worst one I ever saw was Traverse City, Michigan. There's a little wine region up there, Leland Island Peninsula and the Mission Peninsula. And they will pretty much tell you that they hate their neighbors. And everybody has their own bottling line because nobody can support like a bottling truck company. Um, and it's just, you know, they're not overly, there's not much of a, not a community sense up in Walla. Uh, you know, the middle of Washington is just sort of so s spread out that there's not a lot of community, a little bit on Red Mountain. California, you know, depends where you are. Mm -hmm. Certainly you're not gonna get it in Sonoma or Napa, but Monterey they, and Santa Cruz, they are all banding together to help themselves out. Mm -hmm. And I've always thought that Oregon was different in the sense that they will help out in whatever way they can. Um, when I was first getting started, the people that I had on my phone, you know, and they actually answer during harvest because I'm freaking out. Um, and I don't know how many places would do that. And just the, the message boards that come up and people needing help with piece of equipment or hands that day or whatever, they're almost always answered. Mm -hmm. And I just really like being a part of that here. Mm -hmm. So now that I'm in a position to help other folks out more than I ever have, um, yeah, that's, we do whatever we can here. Mm -hmm. that, Oregon's rad. I think that's about all I got to say about that. <laughs> Oregon's pretty rad. I might have to lessen my commute some, someday soon, but mm -hmm. for now, I, I got my dream come true here. Uh, it would be nice if it was like a half an hour closer, but I don't want to bitch. Um, yeah, I guess that's about it. That's me. Excellent. Well, thank you so much yeah. for your time today, for your, telling your story and sharing your thoughts, and uh, go ahead and let you off the hook. Sweet.